Isn't it ironic, don't you think? A little too ironic, I really do think, that a series titled The Ironies of Christmas, the first of which is titled Suspicious Origins, itself has suspicious origins. How did I get to be here? Let me tell you a little bit of the story, if that's all right. I got an email from Pastor Eric asking if I would indeed preach this sermon, The Ironies of Christmas, Suspicious Origins. After checking our calendar and a few other data points, I said to him, yeah, I'd be just honored and delighted to preach this sermon. The first thing I did was reach out to Pastor Steve for some insight. What was he envisioning? What was he seeing? How could I bring a word to this congregation? And with passion and precision and power, he started to lay out the next 52 weeks of sermons. Advent and Christmas and Epiphany and Lent and Easter, the great 50 days, Pentecost. It all just flowed. I even got one of these. <laughs> and I was starting to feel the weight of this whole thing. And trying to cut the tension for just a moment, I said, oh, I, you know, Pastor Steve, it kind of feels like the next 50 Odd weeks of, of sermons kind of come down to this one that I've just signed up to preach. And he said, <laughs> it really does. <laughs> Have you ever been in one of those kinds of moments? Maybe on the negative side, it's like that negative moment where you thought it was going to be a review and then you realized it was not just a review. Maybe on the positive moment, it was one of those evenings where it wasn't just a date. It was going to be the first time that you said, I love you. Maybe what comes to mind is Maximus from Gladiator as he is rallying his troops to face Germania. And he says, what we do in this life echoes in eternity. Maybe it was like I was feeling when I realized these just weren't Braxton Hicks. These were labor pains that were going to deliver a baby. Have you ever been in one of those kinds of moments that it just kind of ratcheted way up and suddenly all the weight was coming into this moment? I wonder if that's the experience that Mary is getting when this angel appears to her. Look at the story with me. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The specificity of this story with the angel's name and the specific place, Mary's name, her role, her betrothal to Joseph, all this brings us down to the specificity of this young woman, not much more than a girl, probably around 12 years of age, her sexual purity of utmost importance for the honor of her family. And so she's in a place of seclusion. She would hardly venture out, certainly not venture out on her own. Her sexual purity is paramount to her future, to her family's honor, to her being able to live in this culture. And so in this kind of secluded place, she is certainly not expecting a visit. Verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, just prior to that question, we may have anticipated a very natural response. We know Mary's betrothal to Joseph. We know her age. Presumably, she is fertile. Presumably, she can have kids. And so this announcement to the reader would just be like, well, we know how this happens, and we know this is going to happen. In fact, the story that precedes it with Zechariah and Elizabeth is miraculous to be sure, and yet it is has a baby the way that babies have always been. But it's her question here that starts to bring the biology into the question. How will this be since I am a virgin? 
Her reckoning of this announcement to her is starting to take place. She brings a kind of urgency to it. How will this be? It's like she senses that everything is going to change. In 2011, I was lying in bed with my eyes glued to the ceiling, my five-month pregnant wife lying next to me, and my eyes, no matter what I was trying to do, simply would not close. So I started rehearsing in my life, well, what's ahead of me that might be in my brain? What might be keeping me from sleep? And I said, oh, this is what it is. Next month, my wife and I are traveling down to St. Simon's Island in Georgia for a conference, and that's kind of a new experience, and traveling with a pregnant wife, that's never easy. When we, when we get back from the conference, then I'm going to be able to sleep. I said, no, 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 because in April, our church is doing a passion play, and it's a significant production for the whole community. I've got a role in it. I've got to help lead it. got to help put this on. Yeah, that's the one. When passion play is over, then I'll get some sleep. I said, no, no, that's not it. Oh, in May, in May, we're putting on a conference in our church called LeaderCast, and it's the first time we're doing it in our community. We gotta sell tickets and bring people in and make sure the team is all fired up and make sure everybody's on board, everybody's on point with mission in what this day is gonna be like. When LeaderCast is over, then I'll get some sleep. And then it really is, I realized, it just dawned on me. Oh, in June, the baby is due. And I realized, just totally peaceful and calm, when the baby is born, then I will get some sleep. <laughs> I haven't slept in 10 years. And that's kind of what this is like to Mary. Mary, this, this urgency, this message coming to her that a baby is going to be born, that, a, that she will conceive. All of this is turning her life upside down. All of this is rearranging. She's realizing not just the next 10 years of what it's gonna take, she's realizing her entire life She's realizing her entire life is turned upside down. How can this be since I am a virgin? Her whole life is disrupted. Bearing this child out of wedlock will lead to scorn. It invites questions of will she be divorced? It invites the suspicion of the whole world. And yet look at what the angel does. He commends her. Verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with God. Here we see a contrast between this story and the one immediately preceding it. When Zechariah asks a similar question, how can I know? But his question seemingly out of doubt, a desire for certainty, and her question out of faith and belief. How will this be? The presumption that it will be, and yet presenting the challenge, since I am a virgin, God is going to do something here. The grace of God through the angel to give a sign here shows us that she is being commended for this question. And now we start to get into why this story is kind of ironic. See, this story is not really suspicious to us, the reader, because we have just heard about this story. We've already been given the sign. God is going to do something miraculous through an old man and a barren woman. We've been primed that God is going to do something. And in fact, if you're familiar with what God has been doing all the way along, then this is kind of not suspicious either. This is just what God does. God brings children through old men and infertile women. God chooses outsiders to bear places of prominence in his saving story. God dwells among the tents of Japheth. God chooses the outsider for his purposes. As Catherine Sonderegger said, just as life would pull life from the dirt, of course we would expect that God would place his life in flesh. This is just what God does. Isaiah 57, 15, listen to this. This is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. God says, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who's contrite and lowly in spirit, 
I do this to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. This is just what God does. This is not suspicious to people who know God. This is suspicious to people like you and me. People who think we know how the world works. People who desire just a little bit more control and certainty. It's suspicious not to people who know God. It's suspicious to people who are suspicious it's suspicious to people who are cynical. It's suspicious to people who are faithful, faithless. It's suspicious to people prone to doubt and control just like I am. See, God comes in this kind of way. God enters the story in this kind of way, not because God is suspicious and not because God loves a scandal, but because God loves the scandalized. Not because God loves the, for things to be broken, but because God loves people mired up in brokenness. See, the great irony of this story is yes, yes, Mary is going to face a scorn when she steps outside this room. Yes, Mary is gonna face the suspicion. Yes, Mary is gonna face the doubts. Yes, Mary is gonna face the danger. Yes, Mary is gonna face all of the significance that comes with this child that she is bearing, but she will do this with God. And that is very, very, very good news. This is not the origin story of the eternal son of God. The eternal son has no origin, but is forever begotten by the father. This is simply God continuing the story of salvation that he started way, 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 way back with the promise to crush the head of the serpent. This is not the origin story of the son of God. This is the origin story of Mary. <laughs> she has no lineage in this book. It's like her lineage begins now. God comes to Mary not because God needs Mary, but because Mary needs God. God has come to Zechariah and Elizabeth not because God needed Zechariah and Elizabeth, but because they needed God. God came to Israel not because God needed Israel, but because not because God needed Israel, but because Israel needed God. And God comes to the world not because God needs the world, but because the world needs God. Yes, Mary's life is turned completely upside down. Yes, it's completely rearranged. Yes, she faces a dangerous future once she steps outside the store, but she does so with God, and that is very, very, very good news. Simply out of the abundance of God's life and heart and grace and mercy, he sends the angel to Gabriel. This is not the origin story of God. This is the origin story of Mary. And friends, it can be your origin story too. Where did you come from? I came from God. God taking up residence within me. God coming to be so close to me. God coming to me in my brokenness with an uncertain future. God coming to me with all my plans laid out. God coming to me in a moment of privacy and seclusion and making this announcement to me, you have found favor in my sight. Not because of what you've done, not because of who you are, not because of anything else, but because I am a God who looks favorably on people like you. I am a God who looks favorably on you. Friends, today can be an origin story for you. And maybe that's another irony that you would come to church and here you would meet Jesus. The truth is we don't always go looking for Jesus, right? Jesus comes looking for us. And he comes right close to us. And maybe he would come close to you in this moment. Maybe you would say, this is the moment where I need to have my story flipped right side up. A brand new origin story, being made new, new birth, born again, all that kind of language communicates to us that God is doing something new in everyone's life who accepts him into them, who follows the word of Mary, as we'll see in a moment. I am the Lord's servant. Friends, today can be a brand new origin story for you. It can be a brand new story, a brand new origin story for you. God can meet you in church. God can meet you in your home in a place of privacy and seclusion. Now, as with any good friendship, some introductions can be in order, and it's always good to follow up these kinds of introductions by letting somebody else know about who your new friend is. And so if today needs to be an origin story for you, a brand new origin story, then you can speak to one of the pastors, speak to me, and let us know. 
let us kind of finalize that introduction. But God can do that wherever you are, even here, even out there. Maybe you'd say, no, I know the origin. I know the origin story, but I needed the reminder. Let today be a reminder of where you come from. Let today be a day where you set aside trying to be remembered for all those things that impress other people, that set you up before other people to be impressive or to be wealthy or to be renowned or to have respect or to have whatever it is and simply be reminded that you can be known by the greatness of your Lord. See, this is not really Mary's story. This is just the story of God being continued over and again fulfilling anticipation that has already been embedded in our Old Testament and God's actions in this world since its very beginning. And the story of God continues through you if you allow your story not really to be about you, but about God. Mary's origin story is truly about him. Do you see the language? The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, it's a scary idea. It's a scary thing to give your story over to another person, to realize that you are not the genesis of your own story, that you are already caught up in one as Mary is here. Did you see how this story started in the sixth month, right? Mary is not in her own story. She's already embedded in a story. It's a scary thing to say, I need a new story. I need a new origin story. It's a scary thing to set aside all the things that we've been building our own story around in order to get reoriented with God. Yes, that is scary, but there are two beautiful positives that can come out of it. Number one, we see the extent of God's love. Friends, God didn't come to Mary because God needed Mary. He came to Mary because she needed him. He comes to us because we need him. And when you realize that, there is nothing we have that God needs. You realize what unconditional love really is. When you realize, when I realize, when we let that truth sink deeply into our lives, that God comes to us not because of anything that we have that he needs, and we realize that God is love. The second thing that stands out to us whenever we realize that God doesn't need us, whenever we give over our origin story to be told by him, and whenever we are reminded that our origin story is grounded in him, then we realize the extent of Christ's reign, the extent of God's love, the extent of Christ's reign. It goes through and doesn't just impact some who are at the top, doesn't just kind of impact the elite, doesn't just kind of rearrange the chairs For those who are already prominent, no, it goes right to the very edges. It goes right to the very edges of the world to people like Mary, to people like you and me, into the very depths of who she is, into the very weeds of our lives. There is no place that Christ's reign does not extend to. So how can we respond to this grace? Number one, we acknowledge her status. Look what Mary says. Her response to this whole story is this. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. It's already too soft. Better translated, I am the Lord's slave. Friends, when you realize that God needs nothing from us, but comes to us in this grace. There is no other reasonable response, but I am the Lord's. Nothing held back, no reserve, no rider, no terms, nothing. I am the Lord's slave. This 12-year-old girl sees with perfect precision what a response to God's grace ought to look like. I am the Lord's. The first way we respond to God's grace is we acknowledge our status. Are you the Lord's? Are you the Lord's slave? Now, that really strikes us in the 21st century as maybe even demeaning language. And I know where some minds are probably going, because my mind goes there as well. It's like, well, what about John's gospel? What about, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Yes, indeed, that's the case. God extends his friendship love to us, but it doesn't remove us from being slaves of God. Paul knew friendship with God and over and over and over and over again, he calls himself God's slave. Do you know why one of the reasons it's so important for us to recognize, to acknowledge our status as God's slave? Because when we acknowledge our status as God's slave, then we will bow to no other false ruler. When we acknowledge our status before God's God, 
I am completely yours, then God gives us the ability to stand before every other tyrant. Mary's entire life will be set right side up. Marian scholar Tim Perry says it like this, Mary's entire life will be rearranged, even her own home. Slavery before God puts her in a different position with her husband than she ever would have had. Slavery before God for all of us puts us in a different position from the world that would want to take and abuse and push and do all those things. One who is slave to God will stand before every other kind of ruler. Acknowledge your status. Number two, affirm his plans. See Mary's prophetic words. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered, and then she says this, may it be to me as you have said. Lyle Jeffrey says this isn't simply a response to the angel, this is actually a prayer. May it be to me as you have said. Mary has gone simply from receiving this message to entering into a relationship with God, to praying this back, this prophetic word. God, what you have said, may it come to be. May it be. We affirm his plans. And now you can start to see why this question can become sign of kind of good news for us whenever she said, how can this be or how will this be? Because we can bring those questions to God as well, not in ways of doubt and cynicism. We can ask this kind of question, not like Zechariah asked, how can I know? We can bring these questions to God. Okay, God, I am yours. I am your servant. I am your slave. I can belong completely to you. And he starts to formulate in our mind a vision. He starts to formulate in our heart desires. He starts to formulate in our mind a way to live out life. And we say, how will this be because of my lack of education? How will this be because of my lack of heritage? How will this be because of my five-year plan? How will this be because I've already got my kids? How will this be because fill in the blank? But you see how this question gets twisted because it's not a way to put roadblocks in front of God. It's a way to see God knock all those things down. And in fact, to see, to show us how all of those things get beautifully worked into the story he has already been telling. The story has already been going and he's just graciously calling us into it, working and dealing and and preparing and using everything that is already embedded therein to tell a glorious story about himself through you. Affirm his plans. Yes, it will turn life upside down or maybe right side up. You know what, you can, you can be respected without God and you can get rich without God. You can have renown without God and you can have regard without God. You can have all kinds of things without God, but what you cannot have without God is a life with God. And in the end, that's all that God promised Mary. Mary, I will be with you. God plus something else is idolatry. Affirm his plans. And his plan for eternity (laughs) is just to be with us. So close as this son of God conceived in Jesus of Nazareth and growing inside Mary's womb is the desire of God just to be with us. Affirm that plan in your life and walk in faith however it starts to unfold. Number three, acknowledge your status. Affirm his plan Number three, be alone with our Lord. Do you see how the story ends? Then the angel left her. And there she is, by herself, in some inner room of her house, her house, alone. Knowing that she will have to take a step out at some point. Knowing that she will have to move out from this place with no angel by her side. Just with God within. Be alone with your Lord. At some point, if you allow God to tell a brand new story, a new origin story for you, if you allow God to give you a brand new origin story, there will be a point in your life where it is only you and God. And that's it. Be alone with our Lord. John Calvin said it like this. This message is buried in the heart of one young girl. That's it. This is where she is. Maybe you're in that spot right now where the angel who gave you the message has now left and it's just you and God. And you know you've got to take the next step. No one else is with you. No one else is around you. It's just you and God and you've got to take the next step. It's okay. Better to be 
alone with God than present with everybody else. Better to be alone with God than to have armies with you. Better to be known for the greatness of your Lord than to be remembered for anything else. Be alone with our Lord. The last thing, the fourth way that we respond to this grace is to attend to the signs. See, Mary has been given this news and the baby starts to grow. But like I said, this story is already embedded in another one. Did you see what it was like? It's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And as the story goes, it says that she got up, got ready, and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, about 70 miles away. Now, for this young girl to leave a place where she would have been secluded, never stepping out, certainly not without accompaniment, now to make this journey seemingly alone is amazingly profound. But she's got to be with the sign. She's got to be around somebody else who knows what God has been doing. She's got to be around somebody else who knows what God is up to, who is going to go to Mary and is not going to be surprised that God is doing something remarkable in her life. She has to attend to the sign. That's what we do as well. See, Mary's life is going to start to have this period of waiting, 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 waiting. Right? That nine months, those 40 weeks, they don't always pass Fast. Now, I have never been pregnant, don't intend to be, but I've been with, uh, married to a woman who's been pregnant four times. And I know that that last trimester where Elizabeth is can feel like it will never end. It feels like it's just going to go on and on and on. Two of our children were born past their due date. I've, I'm not an MD, but I was able to diagnose them with having natal stuchosis. It's like they were just stuck in there. They were never coming out. It can feel like things are just dragging on and on and on. And guess what? Advent reminds us. It can feel like things are dragging on and on and on. As Pastor Jordan said, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Christ, when will you return? But look what happens. Mary attends to the signs. God has given us the signs of communion and baptism These are not simply signs that point us. They are ways that God meets with us, that God does something amazing with us. Whenever you see baptisms displayed on the screen and they're celebrated in the hall, remember your baptism. Whenever you ingest, whenever you take Christ into you in communion by the Holy Spirit, attend to the sign. See, these signs awaken us to what God is doing in the world, to who God is, that that just as God would dwell among the tents of Japheth without overwhelming them, just as God would dwell in a burning bush without consuming it, just as God in Jesus of Nazareth would dwell within Mary without overcoming, without consuming her, so is God alive in this world without consuming it. And when we attend to the signs, we start to see God. We start to see that God who is so close and yet not consuming us, who is so close and yet not overpowering us, who is so close and yet is calling us to give our agency to say, I am the Lord's servant. Friends, attend to the signs. I love what Mary does for Elizabeth here because she becomes the sign to Elizabeth. (laughs) Elizabeth's pregnancy is starting to bear on and on and on and on. But Mary is a sign that God is not yet done. Mary is a sign that God will continue to be with her. Mary is the sign to lift her up. And you know what? Whenever you attend to the signs, you become the sign to somebody else. You become the sign in somebody else's life. You become the sign that they can have a brand new story. You become the sign that their story is not their own. It belongs to God. You become the sign that they can have a new story of origin. You become the sign. Will some of them look at you with suspicion? You bet. They will look at you with suspicion. They might even want to kick you out of their life. They might want to get rid of you. They might, want, might not want to spend some time around you for a while. They might wonder just what in the world are you up to. They might look at you with suspicion, but you know what? Others will look at you as an angel. One sent from God to let them know greetings. You have found favor with God and your life can be set right side up.